Hey there, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to continue in our series of Philippians by walking through Philippians chapter 3. If you haven't watched the first two videos in this series, I would encourage you to go and do that. I'll make sure to put the links above. Also, make sure that you go and you download the free study guide of Philippians so you can follow along and do your own personal study um, as you're watching this series. And I'll make sure to leave a link in the description below. So Philippians chapter 3 gives us some rich and deep insight into what it means to press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Paul uses his own life and experiences to warn against the dangers of putting our confidence in the flesh while also encouraging his readers to place their knowledge of Christ as their greatest ambition. So before we dig into chapter 3, let's start with a quick summary. Chapter 1 gave us some historical context into the book of Philippians. We learned that Paul and the church in Philippi were all suffering persecution. Paul wrote this letter from prison. And we also see how the Lord used these sufferings and these trials for the advancement of the gospel. Then in Philippians chapter 2, we saw a glimpse into the depth of Christ's humility. He emptied himself of the form of God to come in the form of man. And then he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross. Then God highly exalted him and gave him the name above every name and authority in heaven and on earth. Then in chapter 2, starting in verse 12, we see the focus of Paul's letter shift. He moves from talking about our mind and the work of Christ to instructing the Philippians what their proper response should be to all that the Lord had done for them. And now in Philippians chapter 3, we see Paul continue to give these instructions for how they were to conduct themselves as followers of Christ. So let's take a look. So from my own study, I was able to pick out four different sections in this chapter. So let's walk through each of these sections and look at them verse by verse. So first is verses 1 through 6 where Paul is talking about not putting any confidence in the flesh. So let's read this. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are of the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is found in the law, blameless. So the first thing we should notice in this section is the use of the word beware. So Paul is giving the Philippians some very specific warnings. He's warning them of the dogs and the evil workers and the false circumcision. So this word dog in the original language means a man of impure mind. And then the word evil workers in the original language means a man of bad nature. So in these two warnings here, we see that Paul is exhorting believers to watch out for men of bad conduct and bad character. And then if we keep reading into verse 3, we see that he is contrasting the false circumcision to the true circumcision. So it says, Those of the true circumcision worship in the Spirit of God, take pride in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. So if these traits characterize those who belong to the true circumcision, then the opposite must be true for those who belong to the false circumcision. There's a verse, Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from people, but from God. So circumcision in the Old Testament was a physical removal of flesh. And it was a sign that a person belonged to the Lord. And many of the Jews that Paul is referring to here in this passage were circumcised physically, but their hearts were far from the Lord. They put their glory and they put their confidence in themselves. And a person who is circumcised by the Spirit places their glory and their confidence in Christ, as we see in these verses here. Oops, sorry. Um... So Paul is warning against not just listening to the teachings of the false circumcision, but also not becoming like them. 
And this warning holds just as true for us today as it did back then. We've got to be careful not to place our hope and our confidence in our own abilities or our own strength or power. Our hope must lie fully in the sufficiency and the strength of God and in the work of his son that he accomplished on the cross. So the next section is verses 7 through 9. Um, and we see Paul here talking about the things that he considered as loss. So let's read these verses. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Okay, so let's stop there. I absolutely love this passage. This is probably one of my all-time favorite passages of scripture just because it's such a beautiful reflection of Paul's heart and his devotion to the Lord. So we had just seen in the prior passage that he had been he had been a man who was greatly esteemed, right? He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee. He was righteous according to the law. And yet what is he saying in these verses? What does he consider all things, all these things now? He calls them rubbish. In the um, King James Version, it says dung, waste. And then also this word loss here um, in the original language means damage. So Paul is saying that all the things that he had once considered important, um, power, prestige, popularity. He now considers all those things to be wasteful pursuits. He's found a much greater purpose in knowing Christ and anything that stood in his way of this ambition, he considered to be damaged and wasteful. So what an amazing transformation we see here in the life of Paul. And um, we must ask ourselves if there are any things in our lives that are keeping us from knowing Christ. And are we willing to count those things as wasteful and damage to our relationship with the Lord and lay them aside for the sake of knowing and pursuing Christ. So another component of this passage we should notice is the mention of the two kinds of righteousness. So the first kind of righteousness is that which is based on the law, right? So here's what we learn about this kind of righteousness. So it's from, it's from our own, it's from our own strength, our own ability to do what is right, and it's derived from the law. The next kind of righteousness um, is based on faith, and it's a righteousness that comes from God and is derived from faith. So as I was reading this, um, I just had to ask myself, okay, what kind of righteousness am I pursuing? Like, am I trying to gain a right standing with God just in my own ability and uh, my own strength, or am I relying on Christ? Am I placing my faith in him and trusting him? Okay, so the next section we come to is chapter 3, verses 10 through 16. This is where Paul is talking about pressing on towards the goal. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as laying hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So this scripture initially should spark some questions in our minds, right? What is that for which Paul was taken hold of by Christ? What is this goal and what is the prize? So let's first talk about the goal um, mentioned in Philippians 3.14. Press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call. So let's back up. Um, if we look again at verse 8, we see 
that his goal was to gain Christ. So the goal we see here for Paul was Christ-likeness. And we see this reflected in some of Paul's other epistles to the churches. So if we look at um, Romans 8, verses 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Also Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. So Paul wanted to gain Christ by becoming like him. And Christ-likeness begins with knowing him. Okay, so if the goal is Christ-likeness, then what is the prize? Well, verse 11 tells us that Paul wanted to attain to the resurrection from the dead. So this word attain means to come to. So Paul's goal was Christ-likeness so that he could come to the resurrection. And this was the prize for which Paul was pressing on. However, we also must notice the verse prior to this. Um, So what does it say must happen prior to the resurrection? If we look at verse 10 again, um, it says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. So Paul says that he wants to know him. And this knowing him included a knowledge of not only his power, but also his sufferings. So what this is saying here is we cannot press on towards the goal of Christ-likeness apart from suffering. Suffering conforms us into the likeness of his death. And the good news is that we can endure these trials and these sufferings with joy because we know that it's taking us closer to the goal, which is Christ-likeness. And to receive our prize, the resurrection. Romans 6 verse 5 says, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And if we keep moving on into verse 15, we see Paul encouraging the believers with a promise from God. Paul is saying that those who are mature should have the same attitude that he just described as having himself. And whoever has a different attitude, God will faithfully reveal that to them. I love Paul's approach to this exhortation. He doesn't bring the fire and brimstone. He doesn't just bluntly tell them that they need an attitude adjustment or anything. But rather, he gently encourages them to allow God to search their own hearts. And we must do the same. Do we share Paul's attitude in these things? What are the goals that we have set for ourselves? And how does the way that we spend our time and the choices we make reflect our true ambitions. So that's something um, we need to be asking ourselves often is, um, what are the goals? What am I seeking after? Um, What am I trying to attain? So the final section here are verses 17 through 21, where Paul is encouraging the Philippians to walk as citizens of heaven. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us, For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So this passage contrasts the character traits of two different people groups. We see enemies of the cross of Christ and then citizens of heaven. So what do we learn about the enemies? We learn that their end is destruction. Um, Their God is their appetite. They glory in their shame. They have their minds set on earthly things. And the citizens of heaven, they eagerly wait for a savior and they live in the light of the resurrection. So do you see how this section is closely related to the previous? Again, this comes back to our attitude and how it affects the way we live. If our walk looks more like an enemy than a citizen, this should be a warning signal prompting us to evaluate our minds and our attitudes. And this final section of Philippians 3 flows into chapter 4, which begins by discussing how to stand firm in the Lord. So you're going to have to come back for the last video in this series to learn more about that. 
So just a quick review, Philippians 3 helps us to acquire and maintain a proper perspective. There is no thing as precious as knowing Christ. There is no goal greater than becoming more like him. And there is no prize more valuable than the resurrection. So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to keep us um, and to help us to maintain this attitude, especially in the midst of suffering. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the way that it encourages us to press on. Thank you for the hope that you have given us. Help us to maintain the right perspective, Lord, as we walk through all the trials and difficulty of this life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And that's all I have for today. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Leave me a comment below. Let me know what your favorite verse is in Philippians chapter 3. And make sure you come join us at the Girls in the Word Bible Study Group on Facebook where we study and discuss God's Word together. I'll make sure I leave a link in the description below for that also. Thanks so much for watching.